When The Expendables arrived in 2010, the expectations were that of an all-star team-up with the biggest action movie stars of the 80s and 90s. But it never really did live up to that dream, so let's find out why. Welcome everyone to The Collector's Cut, I am Peter and joining me as always is David. Bring it, Happy Feet. This is a movie podcast. We work through movie franchises. Sometimes we'll work through the the filmography of an actor or director or something like that. But we work in seasons, and this is the start of a new season, and this is going to be the season of The Expendables, because there's a new one coming out, and we're going to yep. end it with the, the brand new fourth film. Uh, but we'll start here today with the original Expendables, which is now... 13 years old. I am ancient. I feel like I'm turning into a skeleton <laughs> saying that out loud. I remember this being new and like yep. I'm already an adult and this movie's out and now I'm ancient. What's what's happening? Not as ancient as the people in the movie, admittedly, but... I was going to say, you, you compare yourself. The whole point of this movie is, hey, here are all those old heroes from the 80s movies you remember. Yeah, Joseph... Look how old they are. But Joe, what's so funny about it, though, is, is that they actually look all right in this compared to what they look like now, because it's been another yep. decade plus, and they're, you know, they're really old now. Like... Yep. So... Uh, you know, we'll get into all that. We'll start spoiler-free, of course, as we always do. Um, I, of course, grew up with action movies. I grew up with, with Stallone and Schwarzenegger and, you know, all, all, all those guys. Uh, so this inherently is a as a concept appealed to me. It was, you know, at least in my head, it was like, oh, we're going to do the Avengers of 80s and 90s action stars. <laughs> and that's what the movie is. Uh, and maybe it's not exactly that, though, <laughs> when we actually talk about it, but we'll get into it. Yeah, uh, uh, for me, I didn't have that same exposure. I mean, I caught, you know, the occasional action movie, but it was more so just because they were the big names. You know, I caught your uh, Schwarzenegger films and your Stallone films and stuff like that. But up until we did the uh, bonus episode this month, which was Showdown Little Tokyo, I don't think I had ever actually seen a Dolph Lundgren film. So... Mm. I was not as exposed as you were, Which, so when I heard about this movie, it was more so of a, yeah, I guess that's a way to cash in. Yes, and you can access that show done in Little Tokyo Review by uh, joining the Patreon at any tier. Mm -hmm. Patreon.com slash TV. thank you. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I don't think I ever saw Dolph Lundgren as a leading man when I was younger. I've sort of discovered some of his B-movies as I've, as I've been older, um, mm. But I certainly knew who he was because he was the villain in Universal Soldier. He was the villain in Rocky IV. You know, mm. he, he kind of was in bigger roles as a villain. But obviously, you know, he, he tried to make it as an action star outside of yeah. that. Um, so we'll get into it. Obviously, I'd seen this when it came out. Um, you had not, although you have nope. seen the third one, I believe. <laughs> yes, I caught the third one as part of like just a drive-in movie like it was like the third on the bill so i had no idea who these characters were going into it and now i have absolutely no more context <laughs> yeah we'll get we'll get into all of it i think the first thing i would say about expendables is i think when it's pitched to you and you hear stallone's there you hear jet lee's there dolph lundgren and you'll hear mm -hmm. arnold and you'll hear bruce willis and you're like oh, holy shit and then it's they get you know you sort of have to dampen your expectations because no two of those are cameos they're not on the yeah. team it's actually more Stallone and Jason Statham who are kind of like the two main characters and everyone yeah. else is just kind of support and role and it's like okay okay I mean that doesn't necessarily be bad but it's it's not exactly what I was envisioning in my head when this concept was sort of pitched to me oh yeah no it's it's an issue like to translate it over into superhero films because that's the big team ups that everyone understands it's you hearing oh hey all these people are showing up for this avengers movie or whatever and then 15 minutes in all you're left with is just captain america and thor it's like yeah they're good that might be a whole reason for you to show up but if you came for the team up you're a bit disappointed yeah yeah so there's that. Uh, so I think that's the first thing to say. So, uh, you know, I'm kind of revealing there's a disappointment factor just on that alone, uh, mm -hmm. which was there at the time and is still kind of there just watching it now. But before we go any further, I will ask the broad question is, David, yes. did you mm. get enjoyment out of The Expendables? 
I'm I'm trying to think of a way to word this carefully and diplomatically, but I guess the the blunt object <laughs> answer here is no. Uh, mm. It's it's not a bad movie. I don't think that in concept it's a bad movie, and I don't even think in execution it's bad. But it's just for such a big what you want it to be action packed movie of all these big action stars. You want it to just be set piece after set piece of just nonstop like John Wick. That's pretty much what I want here. John Wick, but with a team of people. This was not that. This was somehow all of the action scenes were a bit lackluster and disappointing the whole way through. I didn't feel like even the biggest set pieces really had that much flair to them. And like I, we were saying before, the team aspect just isn't there to the point where uh, there's one guy in this movie played by, I think it's Randy, Randy Couture. Couture. Yeah. Yeah. Who the hell was he? I think not, he's... not from an actor standpoint, yeah. but just like as a character, who the hell was he? Oh, that's he fair. Barely but... showed up here. But even in the real sense, I had that thought when the movie came out. I'm like, who's this asshole? Um, yeah. And I barely, I mean, at the time, I barely knew who Terry Crews was because he's in the movie. And it's like, mm -hmm. you're kind of filling this out. And they're not necessarily bad names to have, but they're not the action lineage that I was expecting from this movie. But yeah, I think yeah. he's like an MMA or UFC. Dude. Yeah, he's UFC, like heavyweight champion. Yeah. Uh, which, which is fine. Like, that's, that's all good and well. I mean, hell, Stone Cold Steve Austin's in this as well. So they got someone from the wrestling world to... Yeah. No, don't get me wrong like all of the casting choices save for i think david zayas which we'll get to but all the casting choices i think were well enough done for the characters that they're supposed to be it's just that there's barely anything there it's so lackluster and every the only person who i feel like really stands out in terms of getting that sort of extra dip into characterization is actually uh mickey rourke's character I think that he got a good amount in this for the part he played. It wasn't a huge role, but for the part he played, yeah, he got I, a good amount I, of character. I think the asterisk on that is yes, for for relative to the part he was playing is maybe something like you have to really emphasize there because he only has like three scenes. <laughs> it's not much yeah. to it. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's not a good movie. Like I feel like you always try to sugarcoat it by like when you're being negative. It's like, well, it's not a bad movie, but here's all the things that make it bad. So. No. Yeah, it's not good, right? I think mm. I think the action is choppy. It's interesting you said you wanted John Wick because the stunt guy in this is actually one of the directors of John Wick. That's, so, yeah, there you I, go. I, I, fun, I, I, funny, I, funny. Thing. But anyway, I, what I'll say though is that the action is choppy. It's too many quick cuts, so I don't even mm. enjoy it in a simple choreograph. You know, choreo choreography. Chore no, I'm trying to say right. I don't enjoy it in a simple setup sense. I don't enjoy it in that way. I think the bigger problem for me, though, like even once you get past the disappointment of like it not really being the team up movie you thought it was, mm -hmm. is that it's kind of like going for sort of a darker, edgier tone most of the time, and I think it doesn't yeah. quite sit well because I'm like, I wanted Stallone and Arnold and all these guys to be dropping silly one liners and doing silly shit, and there's one or two silly moments in the movie, and mm -hmm. I do enjoy them for what they are in the moment, but I felt like they could have went even further with them. And I'll point those out when we're going through the movie uh, and right. spoilers. But I, I it, you know, it, it just it needed a bit more fun. It just I wanted this to feel fun, and for some reason, it just constantly did not feel anything resembling fun. And I also think that some of the dialogue is quite bad, and not in a fun cheesy way. Like uh, so, there's a scene early on. It's the one scene with Bruce Willis and Arnold in it, uh, yeah. where. Uh, they're all meeting in a church, and it's like basically getting the mission that the movie's going to be centered around. And like mm -hmm. Bruce Willis's dialogue, especially, just felt like really edgy and borderline homophobic. Like for for the scene where he's like, yeah. Are "You two are going to keep sucking each other's dicks." I'm like, "What is like?" There's no charm to this. It's just it's just lame. And then on mm -hmm. top of all that, it kind of feels like you know how we did that bonus movie a few months ago, Baker Boys. There's a yes. little bit of that in this where you can tell these actors all love their motorbikes, and that's why the team are also like a baker gang and they're like off time. And yeah. I just kind of felt like oh, there's a close up of the bike and them all leaving the you know the the garage. Like uh. the movie begins and ends on the motorcycles, and that's the only time. That it's like there. I mean, don't get me wrong. They're in the background everywhere else. And I think Statham uses his bike a few times. But like with it being the opening and the outro, you expected it to be this big thing where it's like, nah, this is a thing that's super important to them. But in the end, it's like, no, nah, this is just what they do in their spare time, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, I will say I do think in the main plot, like, I don't think it does enough with it to really land it. 
but I do appreciate that at least there's a central like moral choice that the movie kind of becomes about to at least try and make it feel like Stallone and by extension the team are kind of heroes in what they're doing. It's it's very thin, but I do appreciate the attempt. And at least Stallone, who directed this movie, by the way, yes. um, at least he like knew there had to be something like that, even if I don't think he does it well enough. And what's so weird is that this is just two years after the fourth Rambo movie, which he also directed, and that's actually pretty solid for what it is. It's been a while since I watched it, admittedly, but it, it definitely, even at the time, landed better than this did. Whereas this yeah. felt like kind of a misfire, where it was like, you know, you, you've got the building blocks here that could, so, of something that could be really fun, but something about the tone, the lack of characterization for everyone. I mean, hell, like, even the main team, like, all but the main two disappear for most of the movie and then just sort mm-hmm. of come back in for the big third act kind of kind of chunk. And it's it just kind of feels like you didn't really... Sp- and I was comparing it in my head, and this is a bit unfair because it's a damn near perfect movie, but without this like idea of having all these big names and a lot of them are the big names whether the a-list names or the b-list names of like action cinema of the 80s 90s and i would gently i'd say it may be more early 2000s but all the yeah. same um mm-hmm. that lineage i think predator if you go back and mm-hmm. watch the original predator the way that sets up its ensemble team and then makes a point in the opening half hour of having this mission where they go to this enemy camp and like it shows how good they are working together and there's so many bits in that action set piece that are very memorable with them like tricking the soldiers or setting off explosives or the little set piece moments within the set piece, right? Yeah. It does such a good job. And this movie in contrast, and they're all individual characters as well, right? And it feels that you get to know a lot of them, even the ones who die relatively early. This movie, by contrast, the opening thing that sort of shows that they're a team that work together is more of a standoff style moment, and then that quickly kind of wraps up, and then the movie progresses, and then when you do get them all working a team, and what should be something to compare to that that big set piece early on in Predator when they're just against mm-hmm. the enemy camp, which is basically the entire third act of this movie, there is not a single memorable thing that happens in that entire third act. It is no. it's. Terry Crews had a very loud shotgun. That's all I really remember from any of it. And actually, a technical... I don't know if it was just, like, the version I watched or if this has like, mm. always been a problem, but it was... This movie was really dark. Like, visually speaking, it was very dark constantly. I I agree it did have a bit of griminess and grunginess to it, but I, I don't think that was unintentional. I think that there were... Especially during that scene, like, here's the here's the issue for me. And this does imp- this does yeah imply the problem of it being so dark. This movie uses too much CGI. There's not nearly mm. enough practical effects here. And the biggest problem is in this final scene, uh, there's a bunch of fire everywhere, but it's all CGI. You can tell it's CGI, and it's not doing a good job of lighting this scene up mm. in post. It's it's all like uh, there's a bunch of bright uh. fire and stuff like that, but everything behind it is completely washed out because of the bright fire in front of it. It, it doesn't light it up. It also affects the violence as well, because there's some moments that I'm like, oh, I should love this, but the CG quality yeah. of it kind of takes me out of it. So rather enjoying that someone got blown in half, I'm just kind of like, eh, it looked a bit lame, you know? Like, I, I doubt they used, like, a single blood squib in this whole movie, because every single time anyone got shot, it looked CGI yeah. spray coming off of it. Yeah, uh, and on the on the darkness thing, I don't remember this being as much of a problem when I saw it back in the day. So I think, like, it is a darker movie, and it's going for this mm-hmm. kind of like they're always in shadows, a lot of nighttime scenes. I think it's exacerbated um, because I was watching like the four K version with HDR, and oh, I'm okay. wondering if like how the HDRs handling the dark stuff is actually making it like worse. It's like it's dipping into like. Like, some scenes we're getting into, like... My, my TV does, like, this dimming thing when, like, right. most things is dark. And it actually mm-hmm. did that in a few scenes where it wasn't a completely black screen, but the TV thought it was because it was right. that dark. And it was making some scenes a bit of a pain to watch. So, mm-hmm. um, hopefully that's something that clears up uh, with the sequels. Uh, but... I mean, just um, from the advertising of the fourth one, not having seen it, obviously, mm. it looks like they're going for that bright, flashy Guardians of the Galaxy style rather than mm. the grim dark that this one was so we'll see how that works out yeah yeah so yeah it's, it's a bit of a, a damp squib is something i like to say 
Yeah. Uh, it's a damp squib of a movie that doesn't live up to the potential it could have had. Uh, it kind of squanders what it, what, it, what it does have. Um, but just to go through, I mean, obviously we have to, we mentioned some before, but we always go through the cast and mo- our movies, the main yes. players, and there's a lot in this to go through. Um, obviously Stallone <coughs> mm-hmm. is the leader. He plays Barney. Which Not a purple we, dinosaur. <laughs> yeah, before, before we get to everyone else, I just want to point out how stupid these character names are. Like, Stallone's the only one who has an even oh, kind of yeah. okay name. Uh, well, Everyone has the dumbest they possible do, names. To be fair, they do imply that they're all chosen made-up names because of their work. They, yes. d- they don't give their real names. Uh, so, I, I guess that's what they're going for. But yeah, so Stallone's Barney. Uh, Jason Statham is Lee Christmas, who they just call Christmas all the time. Yep. Uh, so, Denise Richards and Jason Statham are the two people I associate with the name Christmas now. <laughs> so. It, it made it even more confusing because there was one part in this movie when um, Terry Crews comes in and he, he just finished killing a bunch of people and he says, you better remember that all at Christmas. And I, it took me a second to be like, wait, are we talking about the date or the character? <laughs> yeah, uh, we got Jet Li as Ying Yang, which, yeah. Mm. Borderline racist. Actually, on that, towards the end of the movie, a lot of the army that worked for the bad guys are wearing like uh, face paint, like war paint. And mm-hmm. see, when I was saying how the movie's really dark and, like, things look darker than they should, that yeah. looked really problematic, like, on my TV oh, the way I was yeah, watching it. Oh, yeah, I can it, see that. Right? Yeah. I, th- I think it was a dark green, but it looked black on my no, screen. It w- I think it was black, but it's supposed to have, like, this big yellow stripe down the middle. Oh, yeah, I mean, I did see that, but, like... Yeah, but th- I don't think... I think that sometimes at a distance, the yellow stripe didn't really show. Yeah, I think there's a genuine question you have to ask yourself. If, you, if you've if you got face paint that incorporates some black in it, what is mm-hmm. the ratio of colors? Because if the black is, like, over, like, even, like, 40%, I would say maybe... Yeah. Maybe don't. Just don't. <laughs> like just, yeah. So. I mean, I understand it from a movie standpoint of, like, oh, you know, blend into the darkness and, you know, camouflage and whatnot, but... You have to make concessions for well, a publicly accessible you, movie. You say that, but the big yellow lightning bolt kind of <laughs> goes against true. the stealth part. <laughs> yeah, I think I think uh, the rich guy who we'll get to in a second he uh, he specifically points out why do you have them dressed up in clown makeup, and it's like, yeah, that's fair. Mm. So yeah, you got Jet Li, Zhang Yang, you got Dolph Lundgren as Gunnar Jensen, and I want to point out. Mm-hmm. So when we did our bonus episode, which we already promoted. Um, yes. That was before the sad news came out that Dolph Lundgren has been told he's only got a few years to live and he just mm-hmm. got married to his fiance uh, to sort of enjoy the last few years he's got. Uh, so that's very sad. He is in the fourth movie, so it'll be kind of bittersweet seeing him. And I don't know if it's going to be his final role, but certainly, you know, we're, yeah. if, if, he's, if, he, if he has only got a few years left, he's probably not going to do that much work, I assume. So, no. uh, but yeah, so nice to, nice to see uh, Dolph. Uh, Eric Roberts is sort of the main villain of the movie. He's the evil businessman who's just, well, he's Bob Evil. He's playing uh, an evil yeah. character. Uh, he's, he's, would you believe it, the capitalist. <laughs> but also, he, he, you know, he wants the drug empire, so. Well, yeah. You know. But only to some, I mean, his whole thing, his entire characterization in this movie is, I have money and therefore yes. I can make people do what I want. That, that, that's his whole character. Uh, mentioned Randy Couture. He is Toll Road. <laughs> Toll Road. Toll Road. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and by the way, he has a, a cauliflower ear. That's all we know about his character. That's it. That's the only thing. He has a cauliflower ear. They have not... nothing else about his character in this movie. No, no. To be fair, they did emphasize mm. that he goes to therapy. Oh, that's right. That was the other thing he does. Yeah, he's he does mentally go to okay. <laughs> right okay um the main henchman for eric roberts is played by stone cold steve austin and he's simply called pain <laughs> such stupid name i mean it works but it's so stupid uh so that small island that uh is under control of the villain uh mm-hmm. he's actually kind of they, so the island had an uprising led by our next guy uh, general garza played by david zayas and he was like this sort of Castro style leader who up, you know uprose and had his loyal army. And the evil businessman came in and sort of worked with them to help take over the island. And now mm-hmm. the evil businessman wants to use the island to like grow heroin or something. I don't know. 
Uh, I think it was cocaine. Was it cocaine? There you go. Yeah. Uh, so like they're doing that, and that's whatever. Um, but there's kind of like a, a, a conflict between them the whole time because it's like, ah, you don't care about my little island that I've I've taken over. You're just here for money, sort of thing. Uh, and he says, yeah, clearly. <laughs> Uh, we have Sandra, who is an important character in the island, who ends up helping the good guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have Lacey, who is Jason Statham's love interest, played by Charisma Carpenter, who you may know from the hit television show, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Um, but that entire pointless subplot's there. We'll talk about that in spoilers. Uh, I, I love how, I mean, I'm assuming they just ripped these straight off of the movie in order of importance, but I love how, at least on IMDb, to give you an idea of screen time, Charisma Carpenter, who's this pointless side plot, is credited above Terry Crews. Yes. Like, that gives ter- you an idea. Terry Crews probably does have more actual screen time, but, like... <sighs> but, yeah. But less story. She actually has more character, though, because there's actually a plot, as much as I think it's pointless. Stupid. Yeah. yeah. It, it, you know, there is at least a bit of character there. Uh, we have Mickey Rourke as Tool, and he mm-hmm. is a tattooist who used to be uh, part of the Expendables, or at least was in a similar line of work with Stallone in the past. Uh, yeah. But now runs a tattoo parlor slash gar- garage where they all have their bikes. <laughs> so, and that's really it. Everyone else on yeah. this is background. I mean, that's a lot, though. That's a lot to... Uh, no, no, it's a big... Ca- like, the main poster for this movie, and for all subsequent movies, is just the lineup of characters and all their last names. Like, yeah. it's building itself off of, we have all of these people. Which is is a play mainly on Arnold's career, because Arnold was famous for his movies only having his surname. Like, it would just say Schwarzenegger at the top of the posters. Right. So, which it, which it's funny that he's in this movie, and yet his name is nowhere featured on the poster. Well, how about Bruce Willis? Because quite rightly, they are cameos, right? They're not, mm-hmm. they're not you know, actual characters in the movie, so... I would say, I also vaguely remember a fact that because Schwarzenegger was technically governor at this point, mm. I think, uh, he wasn't actually allowed to be credited because oh, interesting. that would be like a conflict well, or something like that. That's also why he's only got a cameo, where I believe his reign as governor had ended mm. for the filming of maybe the second one, or at least the third one, but certainly it, it mm. ended somewhere in that time and he, he could have more screen time in the sequels. So, right. uh, you know, look forward to that. But... <laughs> Yes, so that that is the the rundown of casting characters, which you know, um, I mean, I will say I remember actually somewhat enjoying the second one. So you know, I like there's a little bit of hope that this is the the low point of the series. Yeah. What this strikes me as not be not knowing too much about Expendables going forward is that it's the flip problem that we had with the first Fast and the Furious movie. In do, that, do you know, I was actually thinking, I was, I was watching this, it was giving me some similar, this is kind of like, not fun like that movie is in a weird right. way. It's, it, the, you go in with certain expectations to it, and they just don't do what you want them to do with the material. The building blocks are there, but they do this other thing. Like, the first Fast and Furious movie does this whole thing of like, oh no, he's building up these relationships with these people. Meanwhile, everyone there's like, race the cars. Just get in the car. What are you doing? This one has that same sort of thing where it's it's kind of this weird, specifically Stallone and Statham just doing their own little thing that's hardly any sort of action scenes. And then all we want is the action scenes. All we want is this team up, this big group of people going in and doing the third act of this movie I think the, for the whole time. I think I do agree with the comparison to Fast and Furious because, again, I was thinking of that tonally as I was watching mm-hmm. this. But I will say, I do think this one is a little bit closer. And I actually think the plot of the movie, like, forgetting how they handle it and approach it, like, there's an island that some villain has taken over and is using it for something evil. There's someone innocent, well, there's actually, you know, there's several civilians that are innocent, presumably, but there's someone mm-hmm. that we've met who's innocent that is going to be the motivation to go in and save the day. And that's ultimately what the movie's going to be. That is actually perfect. That is the perfect setup for, oh, we've got an entire island of bad guys that our, our good guy group can go in like Commando and just, you know, go nuts. That sounds, yeah. that sounds wonderful. But unfortunately, the movie spends too much time with the villains, probably, actually. There's, there's too many scenes of yeah. Eric Roberts being evil and shit. They, they do, there's this whole subplot in here, and that's why I, I didn't quite enjoy David Zayas' performance, is that he's meant to be this morally gray character. He's meant to be this character of, oh, 
yes, I rule over this country with a fist, but I genuinely do care about it. I genuinely want this country to be a good place. And so with this rich business guy running things, oh, I have to choose between my country and money. But he doesn't do anything that comes off as morally gray. All he does is whine and then continues to do the wrong thing. Yes. Like the whole movie. And it's that I just really didn't enjoy him as a character the whole way through. No, I agree. I, I don't think he's entertaining to watch. I think he's too one note. And there's never like an actual turn with him. It just kind of keeps going over and over again. And it just mm -hmm. is unsatisfying to actually get through. So, yeah, yeah. It's it's definitely at best a mediocre movie. Um and I, I do think it has a lot of uh, issues. And I think the, the the biggest sin is probably just the, the lack of the fun tone. Um, mm -hmm. It could use more one-liners, and I think the action itself needs to... like. And Stallone's shown that he can direct action pretty capably, so it's kind of weird that this is so bad for how it's directed, because it is so... It's just constant quick cuts. Uh, you, you can't really get a good sense of the, the, the geometry and like, where everyone is. Yeah. It's just kind of rough. So... Sadly, it's this disappointing example of like what could be effectively. Uh, luckily, I do think uh, this is the worst of the three from my memory. Now, admittedly, maybe I'll feel differently when we watch them again. Yeah. But um, yeah, that, that's uh, yeah, like I say this. I remember there been a bit of a a backlash against three for being PG thirteen at the time, and I too was disappointed that it was going to have to hold back on the violence. But I will say this one, it felt like every time they said, you know, dropped an F-bomb, it felt really forced that like they were just trying to sound tough the entire time. Yeah, there's also the weird thing in this movie where in the opening scene, there's this whole semi subplot of like, look, we yeah, we kill people, but we do it in an honorable way. We kill people only this very certain specific way. We don't do it in cold blood. We don't do it right. just for the fun of it. Yeah, yeah. But then by the time you hit the third act of this movie... Some of those deaths feel a little bit cold bloody. Some of them feel <laughs> like they are going that extra mile there. Hmm. It's, it's one thing I saw specifically, I don't even know. I'm sure that did you watch uh the unrated cut or did you watch a uh no, I believe I watched the theatrical cut of this one. Theatrical cuts because apparently between in the UK there was a scene where a character, a hero character, drives a knife into a bad guy's throat and kind of just twist it for a little while and apparently that had to get cut for the uk release uh for like theatrical cut because it just was a bit too much for a hero to be doing I, yeah i don't think i watched the uk theatrical cut though i think i watched mm. the u.s theatrical cut gotcha uh, but yeah but that's well, that's the well, sort of thing where i'm talking about though but to be yeah just to clarify though it's not that they couldn't have had that it's that they didn't want to go up a rating to an 18 right uh, yeah or actually it is an 18 well, maybe, no maybe. it's a it said uh, in order to obtain a 15 classification, yeah. it had to cut it. So it got an 18 for the uncut version later on. Okay, that makes sense. All right. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, well, which I get. They, they wanted 15 year olds to be able to go see it. So. Oh, yeah. That's uh, definitely the target demographic. So, yeah, yeah. I suppose we'll say spoiler warning then so we can get into things mm -hmm. uh, and whatnot. Uh, the, the only thing I wanted to throw out is that this movie's soundtrack is straight up just everything. Like, if, if you wanted to bring in the people who grew up with these 80s movies as they were coming out mm. this soundtrack is for them 100 percent. well to be fair i do actually think brian tyler the composer is a good composer he's done many mm. good uh, scores and there's actually a couple of little motifs in here that i do quite like um they kind of don't have any room to breathe which is kind of a problem but like mm. they, there is some good little motifs to keep coming back up so i hope that they are expanded upon in the sequel just because i like when sequels take the motifs and run with them and Sort of oh yeah keep going with i mean so. i was i was more so talking about the jukebox songs the old 80s like hits oh, so okay was... yeah well there's not a lot of them but yeah the movie ends with uh boys are back in mm -hmm. town playing for example yeah and there's a few in the intermediary but it's all it's, it's like that sort of time period of rock music where it's like yeah this is what your dad listened to and your dad is also enjoying stallone sitting next to you anyway spoiler warning uh which i already gave but david always has to circle back and do one last thing it's not my fault that you start spoilers too soon. <laughs> God, it's always jumping to the spoilers. Jeez. <laughs> yes. Anyway, if you're watching our YouTube, hit the like button. It helps us out a lot. So please do click, yes. the, click the button. Uh, so, yes, Expendables uh, starts off with a, a random couple of shots of people riding their motorbikes. But that's not really the first scene. The first scene no. 
uh, is on a boat. There's some nasty pirates who have uh, Captain Philip style taking command of yeah. this cargo boat. Uh, so the crew has been held under blade and gunpoint and whatnot. And just as they're making their ransom demands, a bunch of red laser sights all like start pointing at them. And the expendables are here. They're all up, up, up in the upper deck, and they're all pointing their guns down at them. And yeah, this is this is an interesting way to debut uh, this team of characters. When I, I wouldn't say negotiations. What I was expecting is their is their strong yeah. suit. <laughs> Not really. I mean, to be fair, there were no negotiations. They threw down a bag of money, says, take the money and go. Yes. And then the main eye catch begins. Yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, they, they shoot the bad guy. Uh, the key points here, though, is that Dolph Lundgren fires first by saying he's going to do a warning shot, but instead cuts a man in half with this insane yep. uh, high caliber blast. I don't even know what the gun he fired at him. It, it seems like what Terry's cruise gun at the end is, just single shots. Yes. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Um, and right after this, uh, so they've taken out most of the bad guys, uh, but Dolph Lundgren's up top with one bad guy still alive, and someone's like, what's he doing? And Jason Statham goes, he's hanging a pirate, and Stallone goes, don't be ridiculous. Hey, Gunner, what are you doing? Hanging a pirate. <laughs> Pirates are meant to be hanged. I don't know what you want me to say. So Jet Li tries to stop him, and then because they start fighting, uh, Stallone has to point a gun at uh, uh, Dolph Lundgren, and mm. it's basically that Dolph Lundgren might be a bit on edge. There's like, honestly, there's like two lines of dialogue in this movie that say he's using, implying that this is because he's addicted to something, but the movie yeah. just like go like just brushes past it so quickly that it's never even you never even like get a sense this is a story about a man with an addiction problem it just it just feels like a bad guy who's <laughs> who wants to be paid. yeah no that's that's the thing is like they this entire scene introduces this point of Dolph Lundgren he crossed that line he's gone too yes. far this and it's something that happens to everyone in this career you either you know die here or live long enough sort of thing but it, there's like as we continue forward with his character he doesn't seem any different than any of the other ones except that he is on the other side that's it that's the only difference here i wonder if there was a lot of scenes that got cut you know it feels possible like some of these plots probably had more on the page at least if not actually shot and then at some point they're like no nah, let's speed all this up yeah i could see it i know there's a few in here that we'll get to that definitely feel like post-production added in like, there's some stuff that doesn't seem like it was originally for the movie itself. Yeah. So, okay, but Ventures, the team, um, mm -hmm. they're, they're back wh wherever they live in the U.S. Yeah. And they've they've explicitly said that Dolph Lundgren is now off the team. He's, he's off no the team. He's no longer allowed. Yeah, because they go see Mickey Rourke, and he's like, yeah, we had to cut Gunner, he's blah, blah, blah. And there's like, just, like, a gag here where Mickey Rourke's with this, like, 20-something, like, you know, stripper-looking woman. Cheyenne. <laughs> yes. Uh, and, yeah, he's a ladies' man, apparently. Uh, <laughs> but the key thing here is that we start the subplot of Jason Statham's romance uh, life, which... So, uh, the, the thing I'll say before we even talk about what's in this is that this actually... The, the final scene of this subplot happens, like, halfway through the movie, and then mm -hmm. she's never she never comes up or is brought up again. The, the plot's just done at that point and then so at the end of the movie you quite legitimately turn around and say what was the point of that normally you have a subplot because it'll feed into that character's like arc or journey as we're going through the story and you'd yeah. expect that he'd come back and see her at the end and there'd be like a payoff to it but no 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 that doesn't happen so he comes to his girlfriend's house played by charisma carpenter and mm -hmm. she comes out to see him and it's very obvious that there's someone else in the house because the way she's like looking yeah, over her like, shoulder oh, I, I i wish you would have called jason yeah. statham and he's got a ring for her he's got some champagne or whatever he's, he's all very excited to see her and then mm -hmm. this douchebag just goes who's that and he's like who's this guy um and like do you know how like when i watch the dumb action movie mm -hmm. i i like the machismo in a fun way right i like yeah. fun machismo this scene felt like toxic machismo to me. You know, there's a moment where, like, Statham storms off, he gets on his motorbike, and she comes over to say something to him, and the guy shouts down something, and mm. Statham just turns to Charisma Carpenter and goes, 
don't let him come down here implying that i will kill this man if he comes near me right now <laughs> yeah it's it i there's twofold problem with this the first problem is in this initial scene he does seem like a douchebag but he has not done anything wrong no he's no. just a guy who's showing up here so it makes jason statham feel way over the line especially because the whole reason that she's with this guy is because jason statham apparently has not tried to contact her for over a month yes like he's just been gone and like and didn't tell her yeah. where he was going he, he's never told yeah. her what he does for a living i mean i mean understand why that but at the very least like at least say hey i'm going to be away with work for a little bit yeah <laughs> you know it's like whatever. yeah i'll see you when i get back it should be it may be a little bit but i will let you know when i'm coming back yeah. like that yeah. sort of thing but no he just ghosts her and then is all upset when she finally moves on yeah, so he, he rides off in a huff, um, mm -hmm. and that's kind of the start of this plot. And I think the other thing as well is that it, it makes him unlikable. The guy that she's with seems unlikable just because he's got a, kind of a... He's immediately confrontational with Statham as well. They both feel like toxic yeah. masculine assholes, and to be honest. the only thing that really almost pulls Statham back a little bit, tiny bit, barely at all, is he says, that guy's no good. He doesn't give any reason why. He doesn't say why he thinks that. <laughs> he could just, he just sense says, it. that guy's no good. And what's weird is that the next time... So I'm just going to do this whole plot now, because it's like three yeah. scenes, right? It, the the mm -hmm. entire thing's made up of three scenes. He occasionally mentions that it's bothering him with his, when he's with Stallone, but other than that, it's just three individual scenes. It's, mm -hmm. So the next time is he comes back to see her, and she answers the door, and she's got a big bruise on her face, and it's like... <gasps> that guy's uh, no good. Christmas was right. <laughs> yep. Christmas was right. He's no good. And he asks where he is. So she gets on the bike with him and they ride to where this asshole is playing basketball with his friends. And mm -hmm. he gets off his bike. He walks towards them. And there's, there's like maybe five or six of them. And they're all like, don't worry, dude, we've got your back. Whoever this asshole is. Yeah. And, you know, uh, you know, they're all assholes. Because Statham clearly says, oh, you, you shouldn't have hit her face. And all of his friends are still on his side. So, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. way, way to go. Uh, but he, you know, makes a move and Statham just starts kicking the shit out of all of them. You know, he, he does some uh, flips, he, he you know, twists some arms, he does this, that. Eventually, he stabs the basketball. Um, and when he goes back over to Charisma Carpenter, she's just like, or he's just like, oh, now you know what I do for a living. I'm like, that doesn't really explain it. I mean, no, <laughs> it, it maybe implies that there's some, you know, combat involved. It does not explain exactly what you do. For all, for all she knows, you work for the bad guys. Like, you could be working for anybody at this point. Now, now you know what I do for a living. You're Batman. <laughs> yeah, because he, he walks up and he's like, I was thinking about taking your life, but I don't want to go to prison too cramped for me and i'm like yo you try to make him sound so cool and i don't dislike jason statham i think he's a perfect yeah. modern version of an old school action hero but like th that era had moved on so the writing wasn't quite the same anymore and it just doesn't mm. click the same way and this scene's a really good example of that where he just kind of comes off as an edgy asshole even though well, see, he's the one defending the woman who's been hurt see but that's what i think it is is i that's why i think it comes across as this toxic machismo rather than the fun machismo yeah is that they're using this woman as just a piece. Like it doesn't no it doesn't feel like Jason Statham actually cares about her. It feels like he feels more at home of just beating the crap out of this guy. Like yeah, that's what it comes yeah. across to me. So it's more of defending my girl rather than yes, getting back at someone who hurt her. That's a good way of putting that. Um so that's that whole plot. That's not that, yeah, it's it has no bearing Never comes on anything up. else. Yeah. Nope. Um and I think because at least the, the, the main one, which is Stallone sympathizing with this young woman who lives on the island, that mm. at least because it's not romantic, it, it it's more just, no, this woman believes in something, which means she has more agency than Charisma Carpenter's character ever did. Yep. Because she wants to stay and, like, you know, fight back against these rich assholes or try to take her country away from her. Mm. Um, it's like, okay, there's something to believe in. You know, I wouldn't say she's that great a character because, like everyone else in this movie, it's very thin, but at least it's something it's you know it's yeah. it's she has something of her own and it's an inspiration to stallone's character to want to go and save the day that you know she's still a plot device in a sense to you know to inspire the, the main guys to go do what they're going to do but mm. at least it's something noble on her part and that's you know even if she is still technically a damsel in the, in the yeah. sense of the word 
but it's, it's, be, it's, it's better it's better than charisma's character is all i'm trying to say <laughs> yeah no in terms of female characters there's two and yeah she obviously wins out between yeah. the two yeah so yeah and charisma carpenter i think she's in the next one but clearly in the fourth one in the trailer she's been replaced by megan fox so <laughs> i i mean if i'm jason statham i'm not gonna object to that so controversial uh yeah she's not playing the same character though jason statham has moved on right to, to yeah. someone new who's, who's also going to turn out to be an action uh person who would have thought yeah uh because that says fox on the poster it's like mm -hmm. stallone statham fox i was like michael j fox is coming out of retirement yeah is that what's nah, happening i'd no. love to see him in an action movie at this age you kidding me I'm, I'm just Nothing. i'm just i feel like putting a gun in michael j foxy's hand is asking for trouble that's that's why it would be such a great movie that's all i'm saying he's the wild card you never know what he's gonna do <laughs> anyway uh, so they get this mission um and it wouldn't surprise me if this entire scene in the church was also like something they did after the fact maybe they didn't know how they were going to incorporate the cameos and they just sort of came up with this at some point uh, possible they get yeah. the mission from from church as bruce willis's character so the scene is is that bruce willis is there with this job for a mercenary team stallone is there arnold comes in he, he gets the god entrance where he opens the double doors and the, the lights beaming around him i was waiting for the doves to start flying <laughs> up <laughs> which don't get me wrong arnold is the biggest action star of all time if anyone in the movie deserves the entrance it's him that's but it comes in and the idea is that him and Stallone used to work together but there's a bit of a rivalry which is kind of like a meta thing because they do have a bit of a friendly you know this whole scene is a meta thing this everything that they say true, throughout this true. entire scene but, is just meta but you know for, for years you know there was last action hero poked fun at Stallone mm -hmm. uh demolition man poked fun at Arnold you know they've, they've had some back and forth and it's, it's all felt very good spirited um yes. Which is why it feels weird that Bruce Willis is standing there just sounding like he hates everything. <laughs> it's just, like, it feels at least those two are, like, having fun bantering off each other and Bruce Willis just sounds miserable. It, it feels like there are two old friends meeting up and then there's this, like, third guy who just knows one of them from work and he's trying to, like, hey, yeah, I'm part of the group too, guys. And it's like, no, you're not. It's so funny, though, because Die Hard is the best action movie of all time, but it yeah. does kind of feel like Bruce Willis doesn't really belong with all the action stars of, like, the era. Yeah. No, he it, it was definitely two different, like, camps. Like you're saying, these two messed around with each other and they felt like kind of that <laughs> That's same a way sort of area. Phrase it. <laughs> yeah. They messed around with each other. That's that's what you're saying. This one line of Bruce Willis, like, so you guys are just gonna keep sucking each other's dicks or what? What's going on here? Yeah, just edgy shit. It was, it, yeah, yeah, it wasn't good. But you know, it, it proves a little bit of life for a moment. But the idea is, is that Arnold's like, no, nah, this mess, this job is clearly bullshit. This is dangerous. You know, there's no way I'm doing it. Give it to an idiot, and then Stallone says, "Yeah, I'll do it." He's like, "Yes, yeah, he point yeah. point point exactly." And, and he, then he as, the as he walks out, Bruce Willis says, what's that guy's problem? And Stallone says, he wants to be president someday. Yeah, that was and a bit like, too wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Yeah, for, for my absolutely. Day. See, it was funny in Demolition Man because they didn't know he was going to be a politician. Right. Right. But this is like, ah, oh, nah, you're just referencing like the real world. This is shit. They, 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 I mean, I actually remember them making a very similar like meta joke with Wesley Snipes in the third one. I won't spoil oh. it, but there's a okay. very similar meta joke with him in the third one. Anyway, so Stallone and Statham are going to scope out the place. There's like a quick meeting with the rest of the team, which is basically mm. just we're going to scope it out and that's it. Uh, so they have their own plane, as we see throughout the movie, and they, yep. they fly their plane to this island and they pretend to be, uh, what, nature? like the Yeah, like wildlife conservatory. Yeah, uh, and they're going to take some photos of rare birds or something. Mm. And they, they let them in. So I do want to just pause at this scene real quick because yes. I think it's kind of a a little in miniature of this whole movie's problems, I think, is mm. that they stop and they just, you know, hold off on everything. And it almost feels like an improv scene. I'm sure it was all written out, but it feels almost like an improv scene of them just throwing one-liners back uh, at yeah. each other. But none of them are like the the kind of one-liners we're looking for in I, this sort of movie i get what you're saying because mm -hmm. so basically this scene is that they're at like effectively customs at the the uh 
the port you know the it's not an yeah. airport it's just the uh, docks basically because it's a mm-hmm. it's a it's a water plane you know they land in the water um right. and they come up and the, the guy's like asking them why they're here blah 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 and he's like hey you look nervous to jason statham's like am i nervous do i look nervous and stolen's like I don't know. It could be the altitude that makes you, you know, does your skin up no, no good? You close the window mm-hmm. when we're flying, and eventually the scene ends with them stamping the passports to say no. They've they've filled them. They're getting in. Everything's fine. I yeah. think this is the sort of thing where I'm like, and maybe it's because I watched the Mission Impossible movie recently, but okay. I feel like this is the sort of scene where if there was just a couple of lines on the plane on their way there, we're like oh, it might be tough to get through customs, we're going to have to come up with a story, just to set up that there's this chance, or there's a risk of trying to go through, to set up the yeah. idea that this should be tense. Because it kind of comes out of nowhere that like mm-hmm. this is a, an issue that they have to try and bluff their way through in customs. Because when they're flying there, I, I didn't even think, oh, they're going to go through customs. I thought they're just going to, you know, sneak yeah, in. just walk right up, whatever. You know, because they've got a plane, just land somewhere in the country. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I didn't even think it was a problem of that they felt they were going to have to bluff their way in because obviously they came dressed as like he had a canon photo like a camera he was already in character it just kind of felt super easy for them to get in it felt like they yeah. already knew they were going to have to do this and they just were like yep nope here's the story like they've done this a million times and i'm okay with the feeling of them being experienced i don't have a problem with that but it then robs this scene of any sort of tension and it just kind of feels like they're just egging well, this guy on. It, it contradi- They're just making one-liners to throw it at him. Yeah, but it contradicts, though, the whole, like, you look nervous thing, right? If if, if, if the whole point is, like, hey, they've done this a hundred yeah. times and it's never it goes off without a hitch and there's no reason to be worried, then why is this guy noticing he's nervous? I, I guess the problem is I didn't think he looked nervous. No, I agree, actually. I didn't think he looked nervous either. Yeah. yeah. When he says, you look nervous, I feel like he looks like Jason Statham on his best day. Like, he's... <laughs> so you know they, they take some photos of the bad guys who are like storming around the marketplace and then meet the contact which uh, bruce willis said there'll be a contact to speak to them and it turns out a little bit later that this is actually uh, the general who take, overtook the the country it's his daughter uh, mm-hmm. that, that's revealed a little bit later on but she's against her father she wants to like you know save the country she wants to get rid of the the criminals all the rest of it and yeah. she's shown them around uh, to various places and they want to see where the palace is where all the bad guys are and they get kind of close um statham breaks away from them for a moment uh, but this all results in a scene where a bunch of soldiers like catch her and stallone standing about and they come over and they're mad we find out she's the daughter and they're going to shoot stallone basically until uh, statham sort of comes in for the save and we get a mm-hmm. scene where the two of them take out this entire like platoon of soldiers on their own yeah, I think it is worth noting that a kind of a thing that comes up every once in a while is that Statham likes using knives. His whole yes. thing is knife throwing, whereas Stallone has, is a quick has, shot. He has two things, knives and charisma carpenter. That's his two yes. character uh, traits. That's it. I think you could probably boil down everyone in this movie to two character traits. That seems yeah. reasonable. Yeah, Stallone is his, his lucky ring, and he likes mm-hmm. cigars. Yep. Uh, that just feels like Stallone. That doesn't even feel like a character. <laughs> That's just him. Um, and he's stupid goatee that he's got in this. Yeah, that's fair. Everyone's yeah. got something going on. Um, but anyway, so this is all just kind of a means to the end, though, because obviously the, the, this is called in, and like the entire army of bad guys are after them. So it's this race to get back to the plane so they can escape. And mm. the linchpin of the whole movie, the motivating factor for Stallone, is that he's like, hey you have to come with us because now they know you were working against them. It's basically a suicide for you to stay, so you're coming with us. And right. she doesn't want to, but he's insisting, no, this is for your own good, you have to come. But when they do get to the plane, she does run away. She darts away, uh, you know, kind of last minute. And mm. the whole idea, the, the motivation, of the movie for Stallone, is that once he gets away, it's like, okay, this, this mission was stupid, it's dangerous. Uh, even the sort of, like assume the, just from deducing some things that bruce willis's character is probably actually the cia and they're kind of luring in this outside team because they can't be seen as going after one of their own because it turns out eric roberts the evil businessman is ex-cia so mm-hmm. there's a whole thing and they want it all done like in the shadows blah 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 yeah so they, they look at the computer and say what are we some sort of suicide squad and... <laughs> so they make the choice not to do the mission 
but mm -hmm. ultimately Stallone's going to choose to go and do it anyway and then everyone else wants to go with him because they're his friends because right. he just can't like it keeps haunting him that this woman had the choice to leave but she didn't and it leads to this scene with Mickey Rourke where he goes to Mickey Rourke and he says, hey, I'm feeling these things and I can't get this out of my head that this woman wouldn't come with us and she stayed there even though it probably meant her death. Mm -hmm. And Mickey Rourke, um, and this is the scene where I turned on subtitles because I couldn't understand a goddamn word that he was... Yeah. He is like just mumbling shit constantly. And then there's the odd like, actual line of dialogue mixed in, but it's mostly just mumbles but he basically talks about you know this time after years of being this this soldier being this you know uh, militia guy he interacted he crossed paths with a woman next to a bridge and it was very clear she was going to commit suicide he made eye contact with her but he chose to keep walking and he kept walking until he heard a splash and he sort of he's given this teary monologue as he's saying you know i've killed so many people but i had i had this chance to save a life and i didn't take it uh, and it's this regret that he has. I do think this scene is a little hammy, especially since it feels like the emotion comes out of nowhere. But yeah. I, do, I, I, I do like the idea, the, 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 the raw idea of, like, the tough guy Stallone being like, I can't live with, you know, this woman stands for something. She cares about this. She doesn't do this for money. Mm. We should go back and, like, help her out and her people for the right reasons. And that's what he wants to do. I think I think that's the main thing because it's weird throughout this movie where Stallone falls in terms of morality because obviously mm. you know you've got a job you take the job but they always seem to still be on the morally right side regardless yeah like when they're talking they're like oh yeah Somali pirates clearly we're on the right side in they, terms they of that they seem to take the jobs that they can live with they seem to take the yeah. jobs where okay we're doing something ultimately good here we're getting paid for it but we're doing something good which is why i think once it comes to that like obviously a town a city that is under this dictatorial rule of this military clearly that is something that you want to get rid of that is something that is not good but i think it's once they come to the conclusion of like okay both sides of this are u.s cia stuff so there isn't really that clear-cut morally right side of things and that's where they bail out they're just like nope this isn't worth it. It's not something we're into. We bail. It's only once this girl comes in and adds back in that morally right side of things. Yeah. Uh, here's a girl who cares enough that they jump back into it again. Yeah, she believes in something and we've forgotten what it's like to believe in something, but we can believe mm -hmm. in saving her and the support what she yeah. will just try to do. Like that that the, the logic and the the, the 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 on paper raw idea is completely good. It's fine. Mm -hmm. It's not super deep or, in, or like intricate, but it for an action movie where we just want to get a good reason for the good guys to want to like beat all the bad guys, it's perfectly solid. And yeah. it just, you know, it's just buried under a lot of like glossing over things and you know I i've kind of like talked about stallone's like journey to wanting to go back obviously there's some complications along the way the main mm -hmm. one being that after they've been spotted you know at the island um in fact before we go any further we have to talk about their big exit scene because yeah this is where the movie almost taps into some of the silly that i wanted so close it's so close so big scene where statham's in the plane and he's starting to take off and stallone was like sort of pinned down somewhere else for a little bit but he's running for mm -hmm. the plane and he jumps and he, the plane's already moving but he grabs onto the door so he's like sort of dangling from the hatch and been sprayed with water as the plane's starting to like lift off the water yeah and he gets in and it's like hey we're turning back and what do they call it it's, it's like it's like a move they call it a move it was, a, it was fry and die for something yeah, like that flat maybe it's fly and die that sounds more yeah, it right. was definitely fry was in there oh was it okay but anyway, so basically they turn back around, Statham like pops up through the middle of the nose of the plane where there's like a sort of gunner position. Yeah. And but and I appreciate this. Like obviously I'm not saying the plane was high and it was probably a stunt mine, but there is some shots where clearly a real person was like sort of sticking their head out of some yeah. nose of a plane. Um I appreciate that. But they basically do like a a fly over the docks where all the bad guys are. He does a bunch bunch of shooting. It kills a bunch of people, but then they drop something flammable. You know, like 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 a crop duster. You know, they drop. They just they just release the gas. Yeah, because you uh, can do a gas drop while you're flying those planes. Yeah, uh, and they release it all down the docks, and then he state them shoots a flare, setting it all off. And it's just this ridiculous over the top moment, which actually because of how like downbeat the movie's been up until this point, it actually kind of feels like it's out of the wrong movie. 
but mm. when it happens i'm like oh, okay this is actually getting into almost a silly territory that i feel like we should be in with this yeah. movie uh but that i mean it's probably the most memorable action beat of the whole film to be honest no for sure there's not a single other scene in this movie that like the the only other thing that almost feels memorable is the scene where jason statham beats up the abusive boyfriend but that's only because of how out of place it is yeah like it stands out because it shouldn't have been there this one stands out because it is so over the top and insane but then it just never gets back there it never quite gets back up to that level of silly no no it's a shame mm -hmm. uh so there's that and then the other big thing that happens after this is that the bad guys want to know okay who are these two that were were uh talking to us eventually they find the girl and like torture her with some waterboarding to try and get answers mm -hmm. out of her but before that Dolph Lundgren shows up and he's working for the bad guys for money and because they turned on him he's like yeah I'm where I'm like we had a lover's spat so I'm happy to like turn on in them even though yep. uh, Stone Cold wants to kill him because he didn't trust them uh but they're like okay so a big part of the middle of the movie is that Lundgren with some random bad guy that they've sent with him uh chase down barney when he's in his car uh with mm -hmm. jet lee and this is just as barney's decided that he wants to come and try and save the girl and do yeah. do the thing he, right he's, he specifically tells his crew he's like look i'm going back to the island none of you are coming with me and they're like yeah sure none of us are coming with you wink. <laughs> but while he's driving with jet lee um they get shot at Dolph rungs in a car behind him so we get a really choppy forgettable car chase is the best yeah. way i can describe it and when they eventually kind of land in lo a location, they're in like a warehouse or something, uh, mm. Jet Li and Dolph Lundgren have a fight. And because they had the fight at the start, it's sort of set up, they've got a bit of a rivalry. Jet Li's winning for a bit. Dolph Lundgren's winning for a bit. Dolph Lundgren's about to impale Jet Li by like dropping him onto like a pole, almost like Bane holding up Batman. Yeah. And then Stallone shoots him. Uh, I'll be honest, this was very clearly more of a shoulder shot than it was anything else, but they kind of say, oh, it's close to the heart. It's a few inches above your heart. Yes, yeah, so is like, that's like saying, oh, you know, it's a few inches south of your heart. Meanwhile, it's like a foot and a half away. Like, clearly <laughs> this was nowhere near his heart. He, he even, it'd be one thing if they didn't show it, but he even like touches it and it's like right up in his shoulder. Yeah, it's they like, play that scene like fine. he thinks he's dying, and we're meant to yeah. think that he died. So when he turns back up alive at the, again at the end, and he's you know he's a good guy again, he's sort of redeemed himself. Mm -hmm. He's you know he's, he's he wants to work with the good guys. Blah blah. He blah. redeemed himself through nothing. He, he redeemed himself did not do by a damn giving thing. them all the information that he wanted as he thought he was dying. <laughs> I don't think that deathbed confessions count as redeeming I, I yourself. Think it's, I think it's fair, but to be fair, for as much of the toxic masculinity stuff that you could argue is in this movie, I mm. do think it's probably a positive thing at the end where he's like, yeah, I'm working on myself, and then Randy Couture's like, yeah, go to therapy. You know, he's like, yeah, I probably should. Like, you yeah. know, that's at least a bit healthier of a message. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll give it that. Uh, oh, yeah. But yeah, so Stallone and Jet Li show up at the plane, the other three are there, they're all in their black gear already, they're ready to go. Mm. Um. So yeah. And of course, uh, garza the the militant dude uh he's not happy that his own daughter's been tortured so he's like okay i'm done with you evil business cia man get out of my country and he's not happy with that mm -hmm. uh so they're having conflict just as our main team is getting to the palace to come for her I, okay can i just because this is a problem i have here yep so you're saying, you know, Garza stands up to the guy and is saying, whoa, oh, well, 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 I never yeah. used that phrase. <laughs> that stands that to be up. Known. <laughs> yeah. That's the thing is that he's so he's so upset that his daughter is being actually literally tortured. And he doesn't do a damn thing. He just likes he gets all of his guys together and says, ah, Mr. Businessman, you think you can control me. But these men are loyal to me and I want you out of my country. And it's just like. He's being diplomatic for some reason here, and despite the fact that his daughter has been tortured. It still feels like he's trying to keep a bridge up where mm. he's like, now I'm letting you leave off with a warning for torturing my only daughter. But don't make me upset, mister. Yeah. Like he feels like he's not reacting big enough. And then I don't think it happens at this point. I think it is slightly later on. He actually goes to attack the businessman with like a saber. And his daughter is the one that intervenes and says, no, Papa, don't do it. Yeah, she's, like, like, no, yeah, she's basically like, no killing. She's, she's, you know, she's morally good. And he does kind of acknowledge that. He says, you know, you're exactly who I should have been. He says that to his daughter. So it's, yeah. 
you know, right before he dies. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that's the pro- that's the problem with the whole character. It's like it feels like he did nothing the entire time. Yeah. And even when he supposedly had this turn of heart, he didn't do anything to demonstrate he did have a turn of heart. He just yeah, said he did. He, he, yeah, I think typically what I'd expect is for him to do something that helps either his daughter or the good guys as a dying action. Instead, he just kind of right. dies and looks like a tool, <laughs> is, is yeah. basically what happens. If anything, he makes everything worse, because in his last little moments before he dies, he speaks to his army and says, these Americans are here to invade us. We're going to kill them all. This and then he dies. American not clari- disease. Yeah, not clarifying. Actually, some of the Americans are good. Probably should let them go. Yeah, so they end up just being cannon fodder for the Expendables as well as the actual right. bad guys. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, one thing I do have to mention here, which is unfortunate, and kind of, like, for all the things we said, uh, that the daughter character uh, mm-hmm. is, is the better female character of the movie, they do kind of piss some of it away by having her almost be sexually assaulted uh, right before she's saved, just to make the save scene more dramatic. Because, mm-hmm. you know, when, they, they, when they, they have her, like, you know, arrested and they bring her in and they're waterboarding her, obviously it's all awful, but there's never, like, a sexual thing where it's like, oh, they might do something specifically because she's a woman. It's just treated right. as, no, she's an informant, she knows things, she's a traitor, whatever, just whatever. Right before, just as the, all the Expendables are, like, you know, sneaking about the palace, planting explosives and whatever else, Mm-hmm. Two guards come into her cell and they're like, oh, we might as well have some fun before, you know, they come and take her. So, you know, they're implying something. And they don't really go very far with it, but there's just this implication right before she's mm-hmm. hurt. And Stallone, like, cuts a guy's hand off and then stabs him in the neck and, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, but it, it, it's just kind of like, really, we had to threaten her with sexual assault just to make her more of a victim right before she's saved by the hero. It just, it, and, it, it left a bit of a bad taste in my mouth. Oh, yeah, no, it especially doesn't help that at no point after this does she have any agency of her own. She is no, strictly no. the damsel for the entire rest of the movie. Yeah. So, while she has a better starting point, it does kind of just use her in a, a really kind of tropey and thin mm. Uh, One thing I wanted to go back to, because obviously we've been glossing over throughout this entire movie, pretty much every other scene is them cutting to the villains and showing how super evil Eric Roberts is. What is there to say? Stone Cold looks angry. Eric Roberts monologues about how good money is. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Oh, 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 I did did remind me of something, though. All right. It was really awkward. Uh, So when they capture uh, the daughter, who's I keep forgetting her name, what's her name? Sandra. Sandra. When they yeah. capture Sandra and she's like standing in front of Eric Roberts and he's like, oh, you know, I was raised never to hit a woman. But this man here yeah. doesn't have any qualms about that. And it cuts to Steve Austin. And I thought, given that he was actually arrested for hitting his wife, that feels yeah. like a really weird thing to have. I, I don't know. I feel a bit weird about it. It is. I. It's one of those things where, okay, so when did that happen? When did the arrest happen? Oh, that was way before this. This was this, this was way like, before this. Then yeah, that's bad. Yeah, you don't, you don't, you shouldn't make a reference to that. I'm pretty sure that was the early to mid 2000s. Yeah, so it, it, yeah. it was at least like five years before this. I think that's fair. You don't make a reference to that. That's just and especially it's okay. <laughs> I, I, it's not okay, but it's more understandable if you make a reference to it and he doesn't ever follow through. But within 30 seconds, he follows through. Oh, he punches. And that yeah. just makes it so much worse. I, 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 I think it's the thing where it's like I'm not even saying that like okay he's a bad guy he's you know having him even do the hits not even a problem the fact that the entire speech that eric roberts make builds up you know i can't hit a woman i was raised not to do that mm-hmm. but this guy's a okay with it the entire framing of it is what makes it feel so specific and uncomfortable yeah it feels like nobody else in the army would do this except for steve austin He's yes. the one guy who's willing to do that. I mean, mm-hmm. okay, I didn't like the reference to Arnold being a politician, but that's innocent. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's bad writing, but it's innocent. This is Absolutely. just this is just nasty meta referencing. Anyway, the one thing that I wanted to bring up in regards to this villain stuff is as they, I think they are still looking for Sandra. They may already have her. Um, they go into her home and she has a bunch of paintings like that's yeah. her thing is she Which, does portraits just to, and paintings yeah just to sort of add to that to backtrack a little bit she gives mm-hmm. a drawing to stallone as a gift when he's there before and he keeps mm-hmm. looking at that and it's like hey this is like you know an expression of someone who like you know so it, yeah. it, it, it's, it's there to sort of show and humanize her and this scene it's kind of implied that eric roberts is like oh this is how rebellion start is people expressing themselves through art right like <laughs> that felt so stupid 
that was the <laughs> dumb like if i had to point to what is the dumbest part of this movie that was it right there because it's this whole like meta commentary on like no art is the freedom of the people and it's like dude you're expendables what in the hell are you doing with this little subplot yeah, it's, it's not that it's a bad theme in a better movie. It just doesn't fit yeah. in a movie as dumb as this should be, at no, least. It, it would be the same sort of thing of, like, I don't know, if it were to suddenly stop as they're flying their plane and say, you know, we only use green fuel because climate change is really important to us expendables. It's like, what are you doing? This is not the time nor the place movie. <laughs> yeah, so... Yeah, I mean, I, we glossed over a lot, because a lot of them are kind of similar. They're, they're all yeah. pretty much the same thing. And Every single scene can be boiled down to Eric Roberts vaguely threatens David Zayas. Yeah. And I, he goes you, along with it. You could easily cut out two-thirds of these and devote that time to developing the main characters better. And, mm -hmm. you know, not that I think... Because the movie's about an over 40, over 45. The, 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 per, the length is absolutely fine. You could even go up to two hours. As long as the time would be used wisely, I would be fine yeah. with the two hours of this. But... Mm -hmm. Uh, as it is, yeah, it, it just it's a bunch of time wasting. So then you've got all the action stuff. Yep, the third well, act explosions. There's lots of explosions. There's lots of Terry Crews firing his very loud shotgun. There's fire. There's Steve Austin eventually gets thrown into fire by uh, Couture, and it's a very very dodgy CG effect Oof, that does not yeah. look good. So it's it's. Especially because they have this whole build up to it where it's like, oh, Coacher like jumps over this thing just so he could have a fist fight with Steve Austin. And I feel like the writing of this scene was we're going to have a UFC like actual fighter yeah, versus yeah. a pro wrestler. And we're going to show just how dominating he is. And on paper, that sounds OK. But in the scene, it's just two guys fist fighting and well, then one of them catches on fire. I, I don't think the, the, the idea was to show that one's more dominant against it. I think the idea was, oh, these are two titans. This is the, the most famous pro wrestler who's ever lived against this guy from UFC. It's meant Fair. to be this clash of two worlds coming together, and it's just a nothing fight. The fight in They Live between another wrestler, uh, Roddy Piper, and uh, Keith David mm -hmm. is way... Like, that fight is like iconic for just how hard-hitting and... like like yeah. grounded it is and like if they had that fight here it might have been interesting but they didn't uh, no, there was lots of quick cuts there was lots of flipping and uh, and a lot of cgi for the fire CGI. Well, which is yeah actually there is a blip of good stupidity that i do remember mm. actually now uh that didn't make me laugh when it happened because it was kind of like stupid action movie logic is that stallone picks up a warhead right oh right? yeah this is actually yeah. a good little moment right for for all the the, the right and wrong reasons he picks mm. up this warhead and Terry Crews, by this point, is over next to him, and he's like, uh, oh, what, are we, what are we doing? What do you want me to do? He's like, uh, like, throw it as far as you can. So he gives it to Terry Crews, and Terry Crews just lumps it towards the helicopter that the bad guys try to escape on. And then yeah. uh, Stallone, who's a bit of like a quick draws-man to kind of set that up in the movie, he just like mm -hmm. quick fires at it as much as he can with his pistol until it blows up. I thought that was delightfully kind of silly. Oh, yeah, no, it was great. Like, and then they have a whole like slow motion slash... Uh, repeated shot of the helicopter blowing up. You mm. see this debris flying everywhere, and like one of the debris chunks almost hits Stallone and Cruz as it <laughs> yeah. lodges itself in a wall. It's a great segment, but it comes pretty much at the tail end of this whole third act. Of a really but boring third like, act. That's just yeah. it. It's just nothing else. It didn't feel like it was slowly ramping up to this much action. It feels like it was a flat line, and then all of a sudden, no... this scene happened. Yeah, like there's no. Like, I, so the, the the goal is ultimately to survive and get to Sandra and save her, right? But I mm. felt like there wasn't enough, like, geography set to that where it was like, okay, the bad guys got her here. We have to go through this gauntlet of bad guys to get to her. So there was never, like, a sense of progression. It was just kind of like lots of stuff was happening around this big yeah. kind of area with no rhyme or reason. It's just all action-y stuff happening and that's it. I think, I think the other problem with it is that it felt like nobody was ever actually concerned about their safety. Yes. Like, sure, there were some points where the characters were taking cover, but it didn't feel like they were waiting for the shots to run out or they were waiting for an opening. It felt like they were just pausing for a second on their own accord before they turned around and immediately killed everyone in front of them. Which, was, yeah, yeah. It, it can work. That can work to a point, right? And mm -hmm. I'm thinking of the third act of Commando where he's kind of like that, but... 
and, and that and it's probably a good comparison point because he's determined to save his daughter right who's been kidnapped mm-hmm. and he's like working through all these bad guys he's taking out all these red shirts with like you know just complete badassery because that's who he is yeah. um he eventually struggles with the main villain because it's like more of a mano a mano type fight uh, right. but you know for, but all the red shirts he goes through quite easily but you're right like there's there's not a lot of tension in any of this because they are just kind of like like at the very least, if you're not going to sell that they're worried about their own safety, at least sell that there's like, oh, Sandra could be shot in the head at any point, so they have to, like, right. th- there's at least something to care about and, like, drive towards, and it never feels that like that drive is there. It just kind of feels they're- like, oh, we have to pause what the plot is just for all the action and explosions, and then we'll have mm-hmm. the standoff with Sandra and Eric Roberts after it, but it's kind of separate. Yeah. Yeah, because if you took, like, at this point in the movie, the whole thing is that they went around the mansion, they set up all the explosives, and they have set them off. The The central mansion is done. It is gone. I don't know what their goal is at this point, and the movie did not do a good job of explaining it. Obviously, from a narrative sense, we know it's get the girl. They want the girl to be yeah. safe. But it doesn't feel like they're ever actually doing that. It feels like they're just killing these people in cold blood. Like they, they could have easily, they saw the direction the girl went in, but it feels like they went the opposite direction. The fact that Terry Cruz's gun exists in this scene it just, is just evidence of, no, we're here for a flashy, showy fight that's going to kill yeah. everyone. Which, and the sad part is though, is that, okay, it's bad from like an action movie rating point of view because there's like no stakes in the fight. Mm. And that's problem number one. But that would even be... Like, you could have fun with just a light action scene if the action itself was well shot and memorable and fun in its own sort of, like, stuff. But it's not. It's, yeah. it's like, super generic, just, like, quick shots of them firing guns and then explosions going off. Or CGI blood spatter from... from like, there's nothing fun or impressive about it. It's, it's kind of... Yeah. You know, I, I've, I've used this example a lot recently because it's the, the big example that came out this year. But... Cocaine Bear is a great example of a movie that should be delightful fun, but is painfully dull because the CG bear and all the CG violence is got no charm. It's not fun, and then on top of that, the characters are just shit. And that mm. kind of applies largely to this movie as well. The characters are very thin, and the CG stuff and the violence t- takes all the fun out of it. And then on top of that, the action is not well shot. So the yeah. entire escapade of all this stuff is just dull to watch. And then that CGI problem once again comes back in the standoff with Eric Roberts because we have this thing where Stallone puts his gun down because Eric Roberts has got the gun right at Sandra's head and mm. he's monologuing about how I could have paid you double of what like my competitors were just to go fishing for the weekend and leave me alone, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And eventually Stallone pulls out his quick draw, shoots him a bunch of times, and then a big blade or a big piece of glass or whatever it is comes That's through... Uh, Eric Roberts' chest from behind and it's obviously Statham who's done this and he's like, ah, we'll call that a draw because they've been kind of competing, you know, quick draw versus knife throwing throughout the movie. Right. Wh- which is fine. But this blade that comes through his chest is painfully CG that mm. it just looks bad. It looks like it's shit. Not, it's not even just the blade, it's the shots as well right beforehand. Mm. Like, this entire death scene just feels like they couldn't quite get eric roberts to move in the proper way with what the cgi was going to be yeah so it just it robs it of all the charm that any of these moments could have had so if you have this movie and the characters don't feel like a team there's no chemistry really and the action's Mm. not good then what the hell are we doing what's the point i mean even then we we put so much on how much they love their one-liners in terms of just throwing out quippy little dialogue throughout this movie the last thing that Stallone says to Eric Roberts is he's like, oh, yeah, you came for me, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, I didn't come for you. I came for her. And then he shoots. And I'm, for me personally, that's a lame line. That's a that's a garbage ass one liner. They have right a before lot of, you kill the. Yeah, they, they have a lot of quips, but they're mostly I mean, it's kind of what you said earlier, but that other scene, it kind of feels like they're almost just all these little shitty improv lines as opposed mm-hmm. to. There have been actual one-liners that are built up to that are set up and are feel like a payoff when they finally say them. You know, yeah. Like, I don't know. Here, this is a terrible example. And one day when we do Steven Seagal season, we'll we'll see this <laughs> in all of its glory. But oh, there's a God. great there's a great line in Hard to Kill where William Sadler's the villain and he's like a politician whose campaign slogan is he always ends his speeches with, "And you can take that to the bank." Right, mm-hmm. that's what he says. And when Steven Seagal learns that he's that he's the evil mastermind behind everything that's happened to him, and he sees his campaign ad, 
and it's like oh yeah and you can take that to the bank it cuts to steven seagal and he's like oh i'm going to take you to the bank senator the blood bank and like it's stupid but like, yeah it was set up and it was funny because it paid off the setup line that's been there the whole time like you know, that that's something. yeah no that's ex- but that's the problem is that this movie while it did set up this idea of he's the only there for the girl it was earnest it was heartfelt it wasn't stupid and that's yes. what it needed to be it needed to be just like no cap it off with something stupid just anything yeah, I mean, I, I do want it to be earnest. I want it to be earnest as an action movie, but mm-hmm. yeah, it, like, I don't know, pretending that we're a gritty movie with tough characters who are dealing with tough decisions, I feel like was a bit of a, a mistake and a bit of a misstep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's a lot of these problems. I think any one of these problems outside of maybe just how poor the action shot probably would have been livable if the other things weren't also a problem. But you add all these together and you have a really meddling just kind of dull movie you watch yeah which is if this were like a drama or something like that that would be understandable you know you have middling dramas but an action movie as built up as this of we're getting all of these people from your past and like putting them into this one movie it's going to be the avengers of the action movie franchise that can't be middling that either has to be awful or fantastic (laughs) middling is the worst thing it could be and welcome to the worst thing it could be. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I mean, the next one is directed by, I think his name's Simon West, who also directed Con Air. And I'm quite fond of Con Air, so I have high hopes for a mm-hmm. funner time uh, yeah. in the next movie. We're getting uh, a much larger expanded cast in terms yeah, of who's showing up. Yeah. Jean-Claude Van Damme's in the next one. Chuck mm-hmm. Norris is in Chuck the next Morris. one. We, we, got a whole, we got a whole host of people added. So yep. hopefully uh, we're more positive on that. But I suppose we have to rate... Uh, expandables. As oh, I suppose yes. the, the final scenes then back at Mickey Rourke's place throwing knives and uh, Jason Statham yeah. does a nursery rhyme. <laughs> Why though? Like I, it's, it's <laughs> given all this build up too. It's this whole thing where they're throwing knives in competition and he gets a full like minute and a half yeah. to give this limerick to the uh, f- Mickey Rourke's the character. final shot because the whole idea is, is that they've been throwing knives at this target, right? And Jason mm-hmm. Statham's going to show off as he's saying this rhyme by walking out into the street and he's going to throw it from all the way outside into the building and hit the target. And mm-hmm. the final shot of this movie is like a POV shot of the target and the knife lands just under the camera, but it's a CG knife. So the final shot of this movie is ugly as shit. <laughs> yeah. And then it smash cuts to black and it's like, yep, that was the Expendables. And I'm like, oh, this was rough. Uh, yeah. And I think at the time I was kind of underwhelmed by it, but I tried to kind of almost force myself to think it was at least okay. Mm-hmm. I think watching it now, I'm I'm definitely much more into the, you know, like I it's mean, not the it's not the worst thing ever. Don't get me wrong. Like there's definitely see, worse. That's, that's what I was saying at the yeah. beginning. You say I always try to soften the blow, but that's what I'm saying is that this movie wasn't horrible, awful. It's just so blah the whole time through, and it can't be that. It yeah, needs no, to be the memorable. F- the phrase you used is, I'm not saying this is a good movie, but I would say, no, 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 you should be saying it's not a good movie because it is, in fact, not a good movie. That's fair. Yeah. So with that in mind, what are you rating The Expendables? Uh, eight out of ten. It's fantastic. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I... I... I mean, if you're taking the average first digit of uh, all these guys' ages present day, then maybe you get to get to an yeah. eight. <laughs> I wonder. I wonder if Harrison Ford is going to, because I know he shows up in later movies. I wonder if he's going to be in the he's fourth in the one. He's in the third one. I doubt it. I doubt he comes back. Nah. Oh, well. Um, I mean, it, like we were talking the whole time, it's middling. It's very middling. But there is something there in terms of the underlying story. It's not... The problem is, is that the focus of this movie needed to be the action. It needed to be the set pieces. And it just failed wholesale in that regard, barring one or two cool little, oh, that was nice moments. So with that in mind, I can't give this anything higher than a five. And I think I'm just going to call it there. I think it, it's perfectly right down the middle of, I don't really feel like watching this again, but it didn't do anything to upset me that badly. Yeah, um, uh, five sounds about right. Um, it's it's definitely there's definitely worse. You know, having reviewed this year, like the Transformers movies, it's mm. not as mind-numbingly. You know, it's not terrible like some of those are. 
you know, even stuff we've done on this show, if I'm, what have we done that was less than uh, spectacular? Looking back here, the Fast and the Furious kept dipping yeah, under the fives. Yeah, like, it, like, I probably, if I'm comparing this to the first Fast and the Furious, I think that they are very comparable for the reasons we stated. I would still say this is the winner out of the two of them, if I'm mm-hmm. you know, one to one, but, you know, not by, like, you know, I... It's a, it's a, this one wins with a shrug and an I guess. Yes. So I, I think I agree pretty much, but I think, I think it's just slightly unpleasant. And because of that, I think I'm going to dip just a little and go 4.5. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that's where I'm starting off this Expendables journey on is a 4.5. But Which, I do, I do remember two yeah. being more fun. So I'm hoping that we'll feel more positive about two. You start low, and then by the time we hit four, we say all action movies have led to this moment. Commando, <laughs> so, eat your heart out. Like, can I just say because this is what the start of Expendable season is that the fact that that's like coming back after um, a decade, almost yep. a decade. The last uh, three was 2014, so nine years mm. later, they're doing Expendables four. Like, this feels like the only people who probably push for this are Stallone and Statham. And, like, I, like how much thirst was there for the return of the Expendables? I don't know. I, I don't think Stallone and Statham... Like, I'm sure they might have had a little bit of push in this. They might have been like, yeah, no, we, we'd really like to do one. But let's be honest. The big ones are the studio being, okay, what but IPs it, do we already have that we can I just guess. kick out? But did the, the studio summer? really... Because like, I don't think these have ever been that like big money maker wise you know they've done obviously enough to get sequels but I, they've never so i'm looking at i had expendables 2 up already so that one had a 100 million budget and its box office was 315 million yeah that's okay so, yeah it's, it's not great and then three was 100 million and it came back with 214 million so yeah it's it's dwindling returns it's not doing great so and, and this I is a know. year when most stuff has been underperforming especially franchise stuff I don't mm. think Expendables 4 is going to do well. I could be wrong, but I mm. don't think it's going to do that well. The fact that I had to go out of my way to, once I heard the trailer was released, to actually find the trailer, it wasn't just kind of popping up everywhere for me, as some advertisements do. Mm. I don't think this is, because this is live or die, especially like you're saying, after a decade, on how much word of mouth it can generate. I yeah. don't think they've really done a good job yet. Yeah, I mean, Jason Statham's got the Meg 2 coming out uh, mm-hmm. in the next week or two at the time of recording, and that looks dumb and fun. I like, The first one was kind of boring, honestly. It wasn't as good as it should have been. It's, it's kind of like mm-hmm. Expendables. I thought it was going to be silly fun and ended up just being kind of bored by it. Um, given the fact that he's on a jet ski with a katana trying to like, stab a giant shark, I'm hoping that the second one is more the silly fun that... Um, yeah. maybe, maybe they realized that everyone wanted a certain thing from it, and they said, you know what? And the second movie will give them what they want. But, uh, not that I'm saying I'm going to rush out and see it, but, you know, I'll, I'll catch it at some point. <laughs> yeah, eventually. That's uh, a, that's a, it, would that technically be Ace? Is that sci fi? Nah. I well, nah. I, I don't know. It, it, it's kind of brushing up against it because it's a giant shark, but I mean, the Megadalon is technically based on. Like a real I, I, I feel like it probably belongs to us because I think I would say Jaws is a collector's cup movie, and I think okay. by extension, shark movies in general probably get to be on but our show. But then once you get to Sharknado, Sharknado sci-fi, Sharknado, sci-fi. Sharknado, Sharknado yeah. jumps it. Got yeah. it. Um, we actually did do Deep Blue Sea on Ace before collector's cut existed. I would probably say that's a collector's cut movie if I'm asked, All but. Right. We wanted to watch it, so we just did it. <laughs> I mean, that's the best reason to watch something. Technically, they are genetically engineered in that, which is slightly sci-fi. But it's gotcha. you know, it, it's ten US at best. I don't, you know, I don't make any. Uh, anywho, um, so yeah, we'll, we'll we'll do you know Jaws and Shark season at some point. Don't worry. Yeah, maybe <laughs> next summer. We've already yeah, booked this summer. We'll, we'll we'll do a shark summer where we just do twelve weeks in a row of like shark movies we'll, we'll do yep. a jaws then three non-jaws shark movies then jaws 2 then three non-jaws sharks oh god <laughs> anywho uh does it make the cut obviously it does not um that's her i'm uh, not gonna argue that yeah it just doesn't I, make the cut yeah I, I think it's the just straight up cut from the collection it's not quite cut your losses territory but no. i don't see much reason to go into this it's, it's especially not, it's not no, as painful ahead. to be cut your losses right. as i say 
and especially I I don't remember much of three, but I also don't feel like this movie does much of anything character setup wise where it feels necessary for later movies. No. This doesn't feel like one you need to watch in order to enjoy two or three or four. Yeah. So so there you go. That's the expendables. Um we have begun this journey. Uh and if you hate that we're spending four weeks on expendables films, don't worry. <laughs> it's only four weeks. And then we get to dive into a, a director. We don't know exactly who yet because at the time of recording, the vote's not quite over. But right. uh, we'll be doing uh, nine straight episodes on an acclaimed director because they all have new movies coming out. So it'll yep. either be David Fincher, Ridley Scott, or Martin Scorsese. Uh, it's up to our patrons. Uh, it'll be too late to go and do it by the time this comes out. But right now, at the time of recording, yep. they've got a couple of days left to uh And we have vote a monthly vote every month, so... We do, we do. Uh, sometimes it's for a theme like that. Sometimes it's for an individual episode. Sometimes it's for a bonus episode coming up. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, we also have another monthly show on Patreon. We have the bonus episode, as we mentioned earlier, which this month was Shogun, Shogun, Showdown in Little Tokyo. Uh, mm-hmm. You can see why I made that mistake, though. Yes. You can see why where that came from. <laughs> uh, but we also have a bonus show every month at the $5 and up tier, which is called Collector's Cut Extra Reels, where we do a so bad, it's hopefully good movie. And we've had some successes on that. We've done Miami Connection. We've done Dangerous Men. We've done a Neil Breen movie. Um, but we've also done some things that, you know, weren't as good, like the Paradise Motel and... The Neil Breen movie. <laughs> well, well, I mean, it's got a certain chaotic energy to it. I'm not going to argue it, but I'm also going to point out that Neil Breen is back on the schedule again eventually, and I'm not, that's by far what I'm looking forward to the least. Is that true, though? There's a certain, certain cat movie that I think you might be dreading more. I never want to see Eric Roberts oh. again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they should get Neil Breen in an Expendables movie. I, I, okay, I want Neil Breen a cameo in Expendables 4. I want... Exactly. I want this same exact movie of his <laughs> Expendables 1, uh-huh. but I just want every time that Stallone is on screen, Neil Breen green screens himself into the place. <laughs> I just like the idea. It's like, oh, we need someone to hack the Pentagon. I've got yeah. just the man <laughs> for it. <laughs> and it's Neil Breen He's with his laptops. Fantastic. <laughs> for just a one-shot cutaway, I'd love that. Oh, uh, be so good. Admittedly, only nerds in the audience would get what the reference is, but yeah. I don't care. I don't care. But they would pop off harder than you could possibly imagine. <laughs> uh, all right, that is the show. That has been the Collector's Cut talking about the Expendables. We'll be back next week with the Expendables 2. And like we said, if you're a patron over at patreon.com slash TV, we did Dolph Lundgren's film Showdown in Little Tokyo. That'll be up um, uh, around the same time this goes up uh, publicly. So... Uh, that'll already be there and uh yeah so go go check that out but that is the show so thank you once again for watching or listening we always appreciate it keep watching movies and remember to remember this episode come christmas (laughs) 